But really amazing to be together this morning. Uh, uh, we're carrying on with a series called God is Here, and the, 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 the focus of the series is Christmas time. And, and I don't know about you, but when I think about Christmas, there's a whole bunch of things that pop into my mind. The first one would be mince pies. I'm going to be honest. I have an addiction. I'm here to confess. Uh, mince pies are the first thing that pop into my mind when December comes around. And actually, I've done a little bit of research, and I want to let you guys know that between Checkers, Woolworths, Pick and Pay, and ShopRite, at the moment, Pick and Pay have got the best mince pies, followed by a close second by Woolworths. So I know many of you are wondering just with having to buy your Christmas lunches. So there we go. Also, what's quite fascinating is there are a lot of Santas around, and they're all shaped very differently. It's a little bit odd for me. You go into different malls, and there's a lot of skinny Santas around. So the vegan trend is hitting the North Pole, which is good. Um, Another thing that's just really exciting about Christmas is Mark will tell you about all the deals that he's getting on a daily basis. So um, he forgets that he's actually told us a few times. And so every time he comes into the office, he tells me about the very cheap plastic lawnmower that he got, which is exciting. Um, another Christmas miracle is there is no traffic in Cape Town. Come on, who's excited about that? Um, I got to town in 28 minutes the other morning. I couldn't believe it. I did leave it for, but, um, and then... Another thing, which for all the gentlemen, this is a big one, is you can watch all of those rom-coms that during the year you would be judged for watching. Stop looking at me like that. I know you're doing it at home. I know that love actually is being watched by many people in this room. Um, but, and, and really, an amazing part of Christmas is that we get to spend time with family. I know for some people, family coming around is a daunting thing. And I actually know for some people in this room, they aren't families to spend time with. But it, it really is a special time for many where, where parents will see kids that they haven't seen in years, where people will travel and fly and do all of these things. But the great challenge and, and something that uh, has gripped me even this morning as we were speaking as a team is that actually Christmas is not about all of those things. Those are all great things that happen over Christmas time, but Christmas is about celebrating the greatest miracle the world has ever known. Christmas is about celebrating Jesus. And so as we gather this morning, as we gather at church, we have the privilege and honor to sing about the name of Jesus, to worship the name of Jesus, to honor a church that is doing an incredible work. Why? Because 2018 years ago, a Savior was born. 2018 years ago, salvation came to a very broken world in the form of a baby in a manger. And so Christmas is less about all of those very cool and exciting things, and Christmas is more about the people that Jesus came to save, the people that Jesus came to earth to redeem. I want to tell you this morning as we continue on with our God is Here series, I want to say, as we've titled it, God is Here. God is with us in this, in this room, in, in our lives, in our worlds. Uh, I think so often we, we get a little bit confused by these things of church and, well, how does it all work? And I, I want to say to you that God, the, sa the, the ruler of the heavens and the earth, the one who created the stars and the moon and the mountains and the marvels that we get to drive past Table Mountain, the creator of that mountain chose at this time to become a baby to leave the lordship and rulership of heaven, to be born as a man, to live as a man. Be, he was incarnate with us. He stepped away from all of that. Why? So that we could have salvation. So that we could have an opportunity to be returned to relationship with God. The, the God who was completely powerful and all-powerful chose to become completely man. Chose to be born in a stable coming in the most humble of ways. That is the God we serve this morning. And as we celebrate Christmas, as we step into this time, actually, we are celebrating a Savior who was willing to go the 100% for you. You know, so often we live in a world where it's, okay, you give 50, I'll give 50. Or if you're a little bit generous, it's you give 70, I'll give, or I'll give 70, you give 30. And we live in this world of give and take. I want to tell you this morning that Jesus gave the full 100%. There was no holding back. There was no, I'll come almost to earth, and then you guys just need to work your way up. No, he came in fullness. And actually, we read that there are countless prophecies in the Old Testament that spoke of the way that Jesus would be born, and he fulfilled every one of those prophecies. Christmas is a time to celebrate the greatest miracle 
the world has ever known. He entered our brokenness. He entered our humanity. You can imagine this baby Jesus in a, in a manger, in a, in a stable in Bethlehem, laying there, and, and the, the God of heaven and earth laying there, choosing to step into the mess of humanity. It was the greatest journey anyone could ever make to see people on the other side set free. So I want to say to you this morning, no matter how far you are, no matter what the situation, I promise you Jesus has been there and will meet you there. And so this morning we carry on and we have been uh, kind of working our way through the Christmas story in the, in the book of Luke. And so what we're going to do is read some scripture together. Um, I, I trust that's all right. If you have a Bible with you, take it out. If you have a notebook with you, take it out. We really believe that the Word of God is powerful um, and, and we want to engage with it this morning and, and really see ourselves um, transformed by His Word. In Luke um, chapter 2, verse 8, it starts like this. It says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. Now I just want to tell you, in this moment... The heavens opened up and an angel appeared. Now, I don't know if that opened up and an angel appeared. I would probably also be terrified. Excited, but terrified. This is a big moment for these shepherds out in a field. But the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, what the angel is doing here is he's using language of salvation. He's saying, your Redeemer is here. It's not just this, oh, I want to come up with clever words to call Jesus. No, when he says the word Messiah to a Jewish audience, it meant the one who was going to bring freedom to them. The one who was going to bring them life. The one who was going to bring them back to God in deep relationship. It was a, a loaded statement. He says, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God. When they say that word vast, it, it means thousands of angels started to worship. This is a big moment for humanity and for, for history and saying, glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those whom God, with whom God is pleased. When the angel had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, I would imagine it took a while before they spoke to each other, just the angel, and then just quiet. You can imagine what just happened. The guys just looking at each other. The sheep, yeah, not too sure, but they were in it. Um, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that this morning as we engage with your word, as we engage with this incredible story, Father, that you would do something in our hearts, God. That you would spark something in the hearts of the people in this room, Jesus. That as we, as we speak of your birth, Jesus, of your, your redeeming work, Father, we pray that you would transform our hearts, Jesus. I thank you that we would not simply hear a sermon this morning, God, but rather we would be transformed, Jesus. And I thank you, Father, for people in this room who don't have a personal relationship with you, God. I pray as we speak of your word, Father, I pray that you would draw them near. Amen. Amen. So if many of you, you might be sitting here, you're going, okay, well, what happened in the story? Well, actually, the Savior of the world has been born. Jesus, born in a manger. And what is happening is actually the good news, the gospel that we speak about, the, the redeeming work of Christ, the, the work that brings us into freedom has begun. He's been born and his journey to the cross has started. This is a, a massive, massive moment for these people. It is, it is an unbelievable thing. They actually, I could imagine these shepherds cannot believe it. 
Thousands of angels have appeared to them. You can, you can imagine the magnitude of the moment for them. It says that the hosts of heaven, this is a, a big moment. And so often I think we take Christmas and we reduce it and we go, as long as I have a good meal and a, a bit of fun, it's been a good Christmas. But I believe at this time we need to remember and consider the magnitude of the moment. Because when we forget the magnitude of the moment, we don't live the way that God has, has designed for us to live. And so, so often, and so what is happening is there's this huge moment, the angels appear, the shepherds go out, and there are a couple of characters in the story. The first characters are the, the kind of Mary and Joseph. Mary, the mother of Jesus, Joseph, the father of Jesus. And these are, we've spoken about these characters for the last few weeks, but just the journey of them being uh, an angel appearing to them and them starting this journey of giving birth to the Savior of the world is an incredible story. And, and go and read it and listen to our sermons from the last few weeks. But actually, there's another set of characters in this story, and, and these are the shepherds. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever watched the nativity scene, you kind of get Mary and Joseph with the manger. You get the wise men who, who are there. There was a guy named Mur. I don't know what he was doing there. Um, and, then, and, then you've got, and then you've got these shepherds that kind of are always very far to the side. They always have their staffs, and they just stand on the side and never do anything in those plays. I've always been perplexed by it. You're just like wondering, why are the shepherds there? And actually, it's not a bad representation of what these men would have been in society. Shepherds were, were a people who are, were of the lowest social order in their day. What they did was considered to be unskilled labor. It was a, if you didn't make it at anything else, they sent you out to be a shepherd uh, or a shepherd of sheep. They were these outcasts. Uh, the reason that they were outcasts was because in this day, sheep stank. They really did not smell nice. And so what would happen is they would take these shepherds and they would put them as far from the cities as humanly possible. They would, they would go and no, keep going, keep going. You know that moment where, where someone says, no, we're going to play catch. And then they go, keep going. And eventually you're just walking very far away from them. That is what they would do to these shepherds. They would just get them as far away from the city as possible. Because of the sort of work that they did, they could not enter the temple. Because they were perpetually unclean. In Jewish culture, it was very important the way that you presented yourself at the temple. You had to have adhered to a whole bunch of things. You had to have, have been clean in, in many different senses. And actually, because of the work that these men did, they were perpetually unclean. They could never enter the temple. And actually, in Jewish culture, worshiping God and going to the synagogue and going to the temple were completely and totally linked. In their culture, they, they, there was this thing of, actually, I cannot get close to God if I am not spending time in the synagogue and going to the temple. So not only were they the lowest of the social order, actually there was the sense of because of the work that I have been put into, this outcast life, I cannot connect with God. And actually it was viewed in Jewish culture that if you tried to have a relationship with God on your own, it was impossible. The people did not believe that it could happen. Why? Because they placed such a high value on gathering together. They played such a high value on being together at the temple and worshiping together. They were a a people who, for all intents and purposes, were, were very purposeless. It was as if they, they were kind of outcast into this role as shepherds. And, and then what they would do is they would literally sit around all day and watch sheep. I don't know about you. It doesn't sound like a particularly exciting job to do all day. I don't know when last you've tried to have a conversation with a the sheep. They're not very engaging. And so what would happen is these men lived this kind of outcast life. And you know, the, this is a beautiful picture, this, this scripture of as the angel engages, it's a beautiful picture of what God does in our lives. Because actually outside of Christ, we are outcasts, we're separated from God, we are unclean, we are full of sin that ravages and breaks us, and actually we are purposeless outside of Christ. The same lives that these shepherds were living, outside of the life of Jesus, we live that same existence. And so this is such a beautiful picture as this angel appears to them and speaks to them of what Jesus does in our life. We are outcasts, we are unclean, we are purposeless, but when Jesus breaks into our world, when God breaks in to each and every one of our lives, something happens. And there are two key things that I want to speak about this morning. The first one is when God breaks into our lives, when God broke into humanity at the Christmas story, 
we received his presence. You see, the first thing that happens in this moment is the angel appears to these men. He appears to them. He's there. There is the sense of we are receiving relationship again with God. I want to say to you this morning that the gospel's primary purpose is to bring you back into relationship with the Father. It's not to tick your, your Christmas list. You know, so often people will come to me and say, well, well, well you know, I, I, I pray to God and I need, him to, I need Him to do the things that I pray for. No, I promise you, sir or ma'am, His primary role and goal is not to tick your boxes in life. His, his primary goal is to have a personal relationship with you. And so what is the first thing the angel does is he engages with the shepherds. It's the sense of, of, of a, a relationship being restored. No matter where we are from, what, where we have been, or what we have done, God wants to bring us back into relationship. These men were unclean, they were outcasts, they were separated, but the angel appears to them. I want to say to you, no matter how far you've gone this morning, Jesus wants to appear to you. His grace wants to call you near. He wants a relationship with you. The gospel means peace with God. In this moment, the angels declare over the shepherds, it says, I, this, they declare this word, peace. And I want to say to you that the gospel of Jesus, the, the saving work of Jesus Christ, a relationship with Jesus brings peace for us with God and with man. And you know, so often we live in turmoil. I remember when I, when I first started attending a church, I, my, I, I was 16 years old, and it was, uh, I've actually been part of Life Changes 10 years this year, and, and it's been this incredible journey. But I remember when I first arrived in a church space and started speaking to people about God, I remember my life was in turmoil. There was no peace. Peace is this thing that so many people try and achieve in their lives. They read books, they go to courses, they go and climb mountains in the middle of India. They do all of these things to acquire peace. But I want to say to you that the only way that we receive peace is through Jesus. And you might be sitting here this morning and going, well, I'm, there's turmoil in my heart. So, ma'am, I want to say to you, you need Jesus. Because in this moment, these shepherds receive the peace of God. It says in that text, it's so beautiful, it says, I, will, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. It's the sense of, of actually there is life in this. And actually as we receive his presence, there is this, this peace that overwhelms us. I remember being in turmoil and for the first time I experienced the presence of God. It's almost as if that turmoil just ceased. It's almost as if there was a sense of, wow, this is what I was born for. This is what I was designed for, relationship with God. Romans 5.1 says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what we've done, no matter where we've gone, because of Jesus, we have peace with God. We can enter into a relationship with God. The Bible says that, that when, when God looks at us, He sees the perfection of Christ. That is the Christmas story. We receive this, we receive peace, we receive, receive favor, and we receive pleasure. Favor is the, this undeserved grace and, and, and pouring out of God. That is what we receive when, when we receive Jesus. Number one, we receive His presence. And number two, we receive His purpose. What I love about this text, and as we read about these shepherds, it says this, after seeing Him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who were heard the shepherd's story were astonished. How's this for unbelievable? These shepherds became the first preachers of the gospel. These shepherds were the first men to tell anybody about Jesus. He was born, the angel appeared to them, and they went out and shared the gospel what is considered to be the highest honor of our lives, to share Jesus with other people, God entrusts to outcasts. He entrusts to those who were considered the least. He entrusts to those who were unclean. And God says, no, I'm going to use you to do the most important work imaginable. I want to say to you this morning, maybe you're feeling unqualified. God specializes in using the unqualified. He specializes in using the outcast, the broken, the hurting. Why? Because when you do great things for God, He gets all the glory. When you do great things for God, He gets all the glory. And I want to say this morning, as we dive in, God has got purpose for your life. 
This Christmas story is a story and, and as he, as of these shepherds, is these men who were so far from doing anything significant, God chose to use to do the most significant thing. From the beginning, God has given the greatest purposes to the least of us because he wants to show his glory. He wants the world to see what he is doing in our lives. Everything we do acquires purpose because it becomes filled with kingdom potential. You know, so often when we engage with God, we go, okay, God, give me a purpose. Well, I want to say to you, so, ma'am, he probably has already. I know it's holiday time now, but on the 7th or on the 14th of January, you're going to be going back to work. And I want to say to you that Jesus has given you purpose in that space. And actually, when we allow ourselves to have a relationship with Jesus, when we allow the presence of God to become a reality in our lives, every simple thing we do acquires kingdom potential. It acquires the potential to impact the world. In one moment, through an encounter with a living God, these lowly shepherds built something significant. In the story, and if you read a, a chapter before, there's a man named King Herod. And King Herod, as you read scripture, he does all sorts of terrible things. But one thing, he was, he was known as Herod the Great. He was a ruler of Rome. And one thing he was famous for was building unbelievable buildings. He, he rebuilt Solomon's colonnade. He was, he was known, he was kind of a big, in today's world, he would have been a big property investor. He's the kind of guy when you walk into the waterfront and you see those unbelievable buildings being built and they happen in three months and no one knows how it happens. Those buildings, that was what he was known for. The ability to build these incredible structures and, and, and actually he would invest in anything. It didn't matter what that temple was worshiping or what it was doing. He just were invested in these unbelievable buildings. And I want to say to you that that man, King Herod, spent his life investing in these, uh, these humongous things. And in one moment, through the potential and power of God, these shepherds built something more significant than he ever could. Why? Because they allowed the purpose of heaven to grip them. And you might be sitting here this morning and going, well, I'm not that guy. I'm not wealthy. I don't have this. I don't have that. I want to say to you, if you will allow the presence of God to become a reality to you, the person of Jesus, he will use you to build things that have kingdom impact and eternal impact. I don't know about you. I don't want to build buildings that people can enjoy now. I want to build lives that will see eternal impact. That is what the gospel calls us to. I want to say to you this morning, do you feel unqualified? Do you feel unworthy? Maybe you've turned 40 this year. Maybe you've turned 21. And maybe you're sitting in your seat today going, well, I don't know what I've accomplished with my life. So often we go through these phases of going, well, I don't know what I've done. I should have done more. Maybe you're feeling like, actually, you shouldn't be entrusted with anything this morning. I want to say to you that Jesus has got something great for you. He's got something unbelievable for you. You know what I love in this moment as the angel appears to, to these shepherds? It says they were frightened. They were petrified. Literally, an angel had just appeared to them. I don't know how frequently that happens to you. But I also would have been, pet they were petrified. But it says that they still went out and did what they were called to do. It says that even in the midst of their fear, they chose to embrace God. And I want to ask you this morning, are you going to choose to embrace your fear, embrace your skepticism, embrace your doubt, or are you going to choose to embrace Jesus and see the journey that he's got for you? I don't know, maybe you've come from out of town, maybe you've flown in from other parts of the world. I want to say to you that this morning was not by accident. You didn't just decide to come to church this morning. No, God has got a plan and a purpose for your life. And he's asking you this morning, will you embrace all of the things that we so quickly defer to? Fear, anxiety, stress. Am I doing enough? Have I achieved enough? Have I built enough buildings? Or will you this morning embrace Jesus? You see, the message of Christmas is this. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. You know, when we sing that carol, it's for many people, it's just a cute song that they get to sing, I want to say to you that my heart leaps when I sing that. Why? Because Christmas time is when Jesus arrived on the scene and changed the world for each and every one of us. 
I know story after story. I was hanging out with, we had a, and uh, I'll land with this, but we had a Christmas kind of, uh, our home group, we had a Christmas lunch on last week, Saturday afternoon. There were about 15 of us in the room, and we just kind of sat around, and, and I was talking, and I was just looking around the room. And I looked at a man named Kurt van Antwerpen, who actually, a, not even six, seven months ago, had no future. He was broken. He was hurting. He lived a life that was a complete mess. And in a moment in this auditorium, he encountered God. And for seven months, I've seen that man t- take leaps and bounds in Jesus. I saw another a young lady who actually was petrified of church. She's sitting there, and actually, a couple of weeks ago, she, was, she for the first time, decided to speak at Life Group. You know, when we, when we engage with Jesus, things start to change. Things start to transform. The chaos becomes order. The fear becomes faith. When we engage with Jesus, and I just lo- looked around the room, person after person after person, and we, we went around the room and said, what has God done in your life? What comfort zones has He stretched you out of? And the stories were unbelievable. But you know what the biggest thing that came out of so many of their mouths were? I chose to get stuck into community. I chose to get stuck in. I chose to embrace Jesus and everything He has for me. And so this morning, I would ask you, sir or ma'am, what will you choose to embrace? Will you choose to embrace the fear that these shepherds so easily could have? Or will you choose to embrace the future that God has got for you at this time, at Christmas time? Can I pray for us? Just as we sit here now, I really believe God's doing something. And if I can ask just every eye to be closed. You know, Jesus, He wants, he wants His sons and daughters to come home. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're going, I don't understand. I'm not sure how it all works. I would say embrace Jesus. And so this morning, if you're sitting in this auditorium and you don't know Christ, you don't have a personal relationship with Christ, with every eye closed, I'd love to give you an opportunity to respond to the love and grace of Jesus. I'm going to count to three. And on three, all I would ask is for you to raise your hand and I'll pray with you. Because I believe Jesus wants to bring some sons and daughters home this morning. Father, we pray. One, would you call them home? Two, would you pour out your life? Three, thank you, God. Thank you, I see that hand, I see that hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. You can put your hands down. and We're just going to pray together as a community. If you wouldn't mind praying after me, Father, I thank you this morning that I commit my life to you. I thank you, Jesus, that I choose to embrace you. Not my fear, not my brokenness, you, Jesus. Thank you, God. And I'm just going to pray for everyone in this room. Father, I thank you that as we gather this morning, I thank you. Can we actually celebrate those hands that went up right now? We want to celebrate salvations. For those people, as I saw kind of hands pop up in the auditorium, and I'll pray for us in a moment, but I really would encourage you, we've got a team who'd love to pray with you. Please come up afterwards. We'd love to meet you and get to know you. Um, This is a big moment, and we want to celebrate with you and walk with you. Father, we thank you for every person in this room at this time, at Christmas, God. I thank you, Holy Spirit, as we celebrate, as we enjoy family, as we enjoy friends. I pray, God, that you would do something significant in our hearts. I pray that those who feel purposeless would find purpose. I pray that those who have not seen your presence in a long time would would feel the grace and person of Jesus Christ. I, I thank you for people who are embracing fear and all of these things. I pray that they would choose to embrace you, Jesus, at this time. Thank you, God, as we enter into this festive season, Father. I pray that you'd put courage in hearts for people to invite friends and family, God. Thank you for salvations at this time, Jesus. Thank you that you have a desire to see your sons and daughters come home. And so, Father, we pray that this would not simply be a a time for, for simple things, God, but rather it would be a time where we remember the magnitude of what you did, Father. Jesus, we remember you, we honor you, and we say, do it again, God. Amen.